I ask you this morning to please bear with me in my introduction to this letter, lesson, and I say that because it may have a little bit of a depressing beginning, but I promise you that the end turns out much better. Uh, most of all of us in this room have been to at least one funeral in our lifetime. And I dare say that there are a number of us in this room and probably listening to this lesson later who have been to more funerals than they care to count. And you know, when you go into a funeral home, when you go to visit, especially if you're there because of a close friend or a loved one that has passed away, there are two things that happen, two things that you experience, maybe I should say, maybe two things you think about while you're there during that period of time. One is the reason for your mourning. We mourn, we grieve. We do so because we have lost somebody. A family member, a close friend, a brother or a sister in Christ. And our friendship is cut off for a period of time. Our fellowship with that individual is no more while we are here upon this earth. The second thing that happens, I think, while we're there is that we're confronted with a reality of our own mortality. We are reminded of the certainty of our own death, that one day we too will be where that individual is at the time we are there. I believe that the text we're looking at this morning is Paul's response to the Christians in Thessalonica to some questions that apparently they are asking about concerning maybe some of their own brothers and sisters in Christ who have recently passed away. You see, the church at Thessalonica, by the time Paul writes this letter, is a very young church, probably less than a, most likely less than a year old from the time it was established until he writes a letter back to them. And yet in that brief period of time, no doubt, there are some brothers and sisters in Christ, an individual, maybe a number of those who have passed away. And they're sending a letter, or they've sent through Timothy, some concerns, a question. Question seems to be, will we see this deceased brother or sister again? Will the second coming of our Lord include them, or will it only be for those of us who are among the living when He returns? What about that? How does that play out? This morning as we look at Paul's answer to them, I think it's very important because of what he says. Some things he addresses in these few verses. He doesn't go into a lot of detail as far as some things that we might find over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 or even in some other passages that have to do with the resurrection of the dead and that sort of thing. But he does deal with their grief. He does deal with their mourning. He does deal with their loss and he has something to say to them. And he begins by, if you will, dealing with the idea that death is real. Grief is certain. And I might say that as you look at verse 13, he begins by saying, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep. If our Lord tarries His coming, if God withholds his son from returning for an extended period of time, every one of us in this room will no longer be among the living when our Lord returns. You see, death, when you look at it in Scripture, especially in the New Testament, it is often referred to as a person being asleep. A couple of places in the New Testament we encounter that. One is in John chapter 11. Jesus and his disciples are beyond the Jordan River and, and word is sent to them by Martha and Mary, two dear friends of his, that their brother, Lazarus, the one whom he loves, has, is very sick. 
Jesus purposely delays two days before going back, and when he speaks to his disciples about going back to Bethany, which is where Lazarus and Martha and Mary live, his statement to them is, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. I go so that I may awaken him from sleep. Two verses later in verse 13, John gives a little side note. He clarifies what Jesus means by that. Because there in verse 13, he says, Jesus had spoken of his death. But he adds, but they, the disciples, thought he was speaking of literal sleep. So when Jesus says Lazarus is asleep, he's speaking of the fact that Lazarus has died. He has passed on. In another passage over in Acts chapter 7, Kyle dealt with this last week, you have the persecution that arises in Jerusalem as a result of the stoning of Stephen. And what you have there in, in the very last verse of chapter 7, there in verse 60, they're stoning Stephen to death. He falls down to his knees. He cries out to God not to lay this sin against their charge or against them. And then the very last part of verse 60 says, having said this, he fell asleep. Well, we certainly know that he didn't just lay down and take a nap while he's being stoned. It means he died. He fell asleep. Throughout God's Word, there are scattered passages that remind us of two things. Number one, of the certainty of death. Number two, of the brevity of our lives. You go all the way back to the book of Job, and you look in verse 7 of or chapter 7 of verse 7, chapter 7 of Job there in verse 7. And Job makes a statement. He says, remember that my life is a breath. My life is a breath. It, it's, it's, it's very short. It doesn't last that long. The psalmist brings it out. Psalm 39, verse 5, you find these words, Behold, you have made my days as hand breaths, and my lifetime as nothing in your sight. Surely man at his best, at his best is but a breath. And then there's that famous passage that so many of you who are older that will talk about living on borrowed time will be referencing. And that is one that's written by Moses over in Psalm 90. There in verse 10 where Moses says, As for the days of our lives, they contain 70 years. Or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow. For soon it is gone and we fly away. Soon it is gone and we fly away. Or we come into the New Testament and we find Peter quoting from a passage in Isaiah in which he says, Isaiah the prophet says, and Peter quotes him, all flesh is as grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And then there's James. James in chapter 1 verse 10 would say, the rich man is to glory in his humiliation because <clears throat> like flowering grass, he will pass away. And then there's that passage that I grew up learning down in James chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, where he says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will enter into such and such a city and buy and sell and get gain. He says, For you do not know what your life is going to be on the morrow. It is a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. So what we are constantly reminded of in Scripture is that, folks, our lives here upon this planet are not eternal. There is a point at which we are going to pass away. Every single one of us in this room has an appointment with death. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, you've heard it. It is appointed unto man once to die. And after that cometh the judgment. We all have that appointment. And if our Lord tarries his coming, it is an appointment we will all keep at some point in time. But having said that, when we grieve for those who have passed on, our grief takes two forms. If you go on to read verse 13 there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul adds to this. He, he's just said that he did not want them to be uninformed about those who are asleep. And then he adds these words, 
so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Folks, there is a grief that has no hope attached with it. And in all my years of doing funerals, I've seen that grief. I've seen the grief of those who have lost a loved one who is not a Christian. And maybe the individuals that are still living are not Christians. The family members are not Christians. And they know in their minds, we will never see each other again. This was all the time we had with that person. You see, it is a grief in which the individuals stop and think, I will never again have fellowship with this person. I will never again enjoy the relationship with my loved ones again because they are no longer here with me. And they can only mourn. And what they're mourning, what they're grieving for, is what they had in the past. What once was. You see, in their minds... This life is all there is. This is the only time we have. And, and, and in their minds, I might as well go for the gusto. We might as well live for the moment. We might as well indulge ourselves in the earthly pleasures of this life because once this life is over, once we have died, that's all there is. There is nothing else. And so they grieve because for them, there is no hope beyond the grave. But Paul said for us that we are not to grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Which means that you and I have hope. We have hope of something beyond the grave. We have hope of something beyond the funeral home. We have hope of something that is eternal, something that is everlasting. And he goes on to address that to some extent in the very next verse. Because he says there in verse 14, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. He's talking about those who've died in Christ, those who have died as Christians. If we're grieving for a person that we've lost who was a child of God in this life, our grief is not as the grief of those who have no hope. Because you see, we have hope, and our hope is tied to the knowledge that Jesus died and that Jesus rose again. He is no longer in a grave somewhere over around Jerusalem. This was a fact that was conveyed. It was a part of the message that was conveyed, conveyed by the angels in the tomb. If you go to several passages, but for one, Matthew 28, verse 5. We find there the angel saying to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who has been crucified. And then the angel says, He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said, Come, see the place where he was lying. That was the message that the angels delivered to those who came to the tomb to see for themselves. Where's the body? It was the message that Peter proclaimed to the crowds on Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, verse 32, he says, This Jesus God has raised up again, uh, to which we are all witnesses. We have seen him ourselves. We can testify, he's not dead, he is alive. He declared that same message before the Sanhedrin on two occasions, both in Acts 4, verse 10 and Acts chapter 5, verse 30. He declared it to the household of Cornelius, or excuse me, Cornelius over in Acts chapter 10. It was also Paul's mantra, if you will, throughout both his preaching and his teaching and his letter writing. Passage after passage, if you just work through his letters, and even in the book of Acts, you find him saying this over and over again. As a matter of fact, when you come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which is the great chapter on the resurrection, he says there in verses 3 and 4, he says, I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for 
for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised again on the third day according to the Scriptures. So if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, Paul says, do you believe that? Do you believe that the Son of God is living and is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high? That He's reigning over His church? If you do, then that gives you hope. Because our resurrection, our eternal life is based upon His resurrection. And so we can take that and that can give us hope. But our hope is also connected to something else. It is connected to the knowledge that not only Jesus has risen from the dead, but also to the belief that He, that God, will bring with Him our brothers and our sisters in Christ who has, as Paul says, fallen asleep in, literally it says, through Jesus. The souls of those who have died in Christ will return with Christ when He comes back. And Paul says, this I say to you by the word of the Lord. This isn't hearsay. This isn't just something I've conceived in my own mind. This is something that the, the Lord Himself has declared to me. And this is what I am now saying to you. And this is what I want you to hear. To the brethren in Thessalonica who were concerned about their loved ones who had passed on. And He begins to break it down for them. As a matter of fact, if you look at verse 16, He talks about a, a something that is going to happen. And he tells us there in verses 15 and 16 concerning this that's going to play, take place. He says that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not perceive those who have fallen asleep. And then verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Remember I said that Jesus Christ is presently seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, the right hand of God. Several passages bring that out, but Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 is one of those where there the writer tells us that when he had made purification from sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's where he is seated. Well, here is what's going to happen. Here is what Paul is telling us is going to happen. On that day, when God says, the time is now, on that day when he is to come again, Paul says the Lord himself will descend from heaven. It won't be a substitute. It won't be just an angel or two. It is the Lord himself that is going to leave his heavenly throne and he is going to come back to this earth. He is coming. Oh, you can read other passages that tell us that every eye will see him. But if the fact is, He is coming. It will be the same Jesus who ascended into the heavens, into the clouds from His disciples all the way back in Acts chapter 1. You may remember as they're looking up, watching Him go up into the clouds, there are two men standing by in white. And they say to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? Why are you still standing here looking up? This same Jesus who has been raised up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you've watched him go into heaven. He's coming back the same way he's gone. But he's coming back. And Paul tells us that there are several sounds that are going to be heard on that day. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. That word that is translated shout is a word that means a commanding shout. He is going to descend from heaven with a shout of command. What is it going to be? Scripture doesn't tell us. Might it be a similar command to the one that we encounter over in John chapter 11, there in verse 43, where Jesus calls for Lazarus to come forth, only this shout will be for all of the righteous dead to come forth. It will be heard, I promise you. And the voice of the archangel, 
Might that be the angel Michael? Of whom we read over in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13 or in Jude chapter 9 where he is called the archangel Michael. Or may it be another angel that God will send. And what will the, the archangel say on that day? I don't know. We're not told. We're simply told that there will be a shout, a command of some sort in the voice of the archangel and then there's the trumpet of God. The trumpet of God. Is it the trumpet that will sound at the last day? The trumpet of which Paul spoke over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, where he says there, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will all be changed. You know, regardless of how we interpret these sounds, One thing is clear. Folks, our Lord's return for His saints on that day will be announced forcefully from heaven with great fanfare. There will be no mistaking on that day what is taking place. There will be no wondering, what is that? Everyone will know. It's the day. You and I as Christians, if we're still alive, will be saying, oh, it's the day I've been waiting for. It's the day I've been praying about. It's the day I've been longing for. And the point he makes there is that the bodies of those who have died in Christ will rise before any living Christians will be caught up in the air. Because if you notice there at the end of verse 16, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Those of us, if we happen to be alive at the time of our Lord's coming, oh, we will not be given preferential treatment over those who passed on. No, those who have passed on, who've died in Christ, they are first in line. They are the first to be called forth. We will wait our turn on that day. But it's all going to happen so quickly we may not even realize how quickly it has taken place. Because the next thing he says is that we who are alive and remain will be called up together with them in the clouds. You know, after our, the bodies of those Christians who've died have been called up, have been called forth from the graves, those of us who are alive and remain. And I love this word. He says we'll be called up. But the word called up is, is a word that means a sudden action. It means a snatching, a seizing, a gathering up. A hastily calling forth, bringing them out. And what's going to happen? We shall join them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Verse 17. And I love what he says next. Because this is where the, the beauty in all of this is described in the very last part of verse 17. We. We, those who have died in Christ before His return, those Christians who are still alive at His return, we shall always be with the Lord. Always. Never to depart forevermore. Always has no ending. Always means just that. Always. The saints of all ages will be together forevermore. And then the very last verse that Larry read for us just a moment ago, verse 18. Listen to what he says. Therefore, comfort, encourage one another with these words. It's a command. It's not, please do this. Would you consider doing this? It is a command. 
And folks, it is a command I have, I have great joy to fulfill, to comfort others with these words. I can't think of any words which will make our grief as Christians any easier to bear. I can't think of any words which will cause our hope in our eternal life and our God's redemption of us to be any more steadfast. I can't think of any words that will give us any greater joy. But as I stand here before you today, I must tell you something. Everything that I've said to you, everything I've shared with you this morning, these promises are for those who die in the Lord. Remember, I would not have you grieve as do the rest who have no hope. These promises, everything that we've looked at are for those who die as Christians. It is for those who are living as faithful followers of Christ at the return of our Lord. So the question I must leave you with, and it's several questions involved in this this morning, is very simple. Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? Have you turned away from the sin that separates you from God and condemns you to eternal torment? Have you done that? Have you confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in your life? Have you been baptized, immersed in water so that the blood of Christ might wash away your sins? You see, that's what Scripture teaches as far as concerning becoming a Christian. And then if you're a Christian, are you living for Him today? Are you living your life right now in a way that says, I love you, I want to honor you, I want to be with you eternally? Because I, like you, want to be with our Lord eternally. And as the one who preaches so many of the funerals that are done for this congregation and in this community, I want to be able to comfort others with these words when you pass. Please let it be easy for me, but even more, let it be a joy for you to look forward to your Lord's coming, to anticipate that day with great joy. If for any reason you need to respond this morning to our Lord's invitation, don't delay, don't put it off, don't say maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, Right now, right now, won't you come as together we stand and sing.